Anyway, so I'm uh, Pavel Pulkanen from the University of Helsinki, University of Sherbrooke, and I'll be chairing this session. And our first speaker is Professor Michael Silberstein from Elizabethtown College. And I think I let you put on the title yourself on your first slide because it's. A... Yeah, I'm just waiting for the slides to pop up. Yeah. So anyway, so if we're waiting for that. Then there, we there go. it is. There it is. Anyway, please. Okay, so I'm the guy on that slide, Michael Silberstein. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone in Zoom land. Um, so this talk is about a particular approach to the hard problem uh, based in biological naturalism. That's an overview of the talk. So don't worry, there's no way I'll get through all that. Um, so first thing, just defining the hard problem, more than one way to do it. Here's a sort of standard way. If you believe that matter alone is fundamental, Matter is inherently non-conscious. We're made of matter alone, and PC, phenomenal consciousness, exists and cannot be reduced to or identified with the physical with matter. Then you have a hard problem, sometimes called a generation problem. Uh, how and why are we and other animals conscious? If you buy all those assumptions, it looks like this is a real problem. So then it would seem that any brain-based account of phenomenal consciousness must address this question and satisfactorily close any further but why questions. Or is that really true? We're gonna see there's a brand of biological naturalism that denies that they have to do that. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about ultimately. So the history of biological naturalism, sometimes called biological realism, I think goes back, I mean, the deep history goes much further, but it goes back to this book um, from Koch and Crick called The Astonishing Hypothesis. And basically the idea is to quote, everything mental is a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated chemistry. That's a pretty, pretty straightforward view. Uh, but the message was very clear. Um, anybody who saw Christoph talk today, he, he went through some of this same history. But the message is very clear that philosophies had thousands of years to worry about the mind problem, body and body problem. They've never made any progress. So now let cognitive neuroscience take over and they'll fix the problem just like they fixed the problem of life. And that's the idea. So what is biological naturalism in a nutshell? That phenomenal consciousness is a real biological product. The brain causes, realizes, or otherwise determines both the existence and the states of phenomenal consciousness. That John Searle, philosopher John Searle is probably the philosopher most widely associated with this view. Uh, and just to break it down a little bit more, that cognitive neuroscience should proceed as follows. Find the neural correlate of consciousness for some subset of consciousness like visual perception or the entire field of consciousness. Uh, and the neural correlate of consciousness, of course, as we know, means the minimally sufficient neural condition for that conscious state such that were that neural state or process not there, that conscious state would not be there as well. That was the idea. Then once you have that, you use the neural correlate to find the causal mechanism. So, you know, so it's mechanism hunting, hunting, just good old fashioned biology is applied to conscious experience. Some things to keep in mind about biological naturalism. Um, it takes subjectivity seriously, and it's supposed to be a competitor to functionalism of any variety of functionalism. Um, and, but beyond that, stories about how consciousness relates to the main, to the brain vary a lot. There are some examples there. I obviously don't have time to work through those, their pros and cons, but those are just some metaphors, models, or what have you. Obviously, some of these are causal models. Some of these are constitutive models, in which case um, you're going to get different sort of metaphors about it, but, but that's the idea. That's how this game is supposed to be played. Here's some contenders for the neural correlative consciousness from the past. Again, I don't have time to go through these, all these different accounts, but the bottom line here is there's no consensus um, and all the contenders that I have on the slide fail for one reason or another to be minimally sufficient conditions. There's a consensus about that at least, but no consensus about what it is. So um, they, in the 1990s, you, you, again, Christoph said all these things himself today. They came in as gangbusters about how they're going to solve this problem that philosophy has failed to solve for thousands of years. Uh, so what happened? We can start talking about that. This is Ravon Zhu, of course, and he's asking, well, 20 years later, what happened to the exuberance of biological naturalists? 
in the cognitive neuroscience of consciousness. Here's what he says. It is too early to hand the explanation of consciousness from philosophers to neuroscientists. The interaction between philosophy and neuroscience has in fact been going the other way around recently. Some, reading, some leading neuroscientists used to be firmly committed to something like biological naturalism in the 90s, such as Tonini and Koch, have recently turned away from biological-based metaphysics for consciousness. Because the explanatory gap in the heart problem remain unsolved and no imaginable solutions are in sight, neuroscientists may not find biological approaches such as bi biological naturalism convincing. So that's kind of historically what happened, right? And is, is still happening. So, so more specifically, why did they fail to find the NCC? What, what, what exactly happened? Well, again, you heard, you heard it today in Christoph's talk. One of the things we learned is that large, that's the first point there, large portions of the brain are just irrelevant. You can separate out phenomenal consciousness from attention, awareness, arousal, all kinds of other cognitive functions. Um, and when you do that and you start, you know, whether it happens naturally or whatever, you start taking away parts of the brain, vast parts of the brain are simply not relevant, at least in terms of a neural correlate. Another second bullet point, another problem we're dealing with is it's still not exactly clear what the spatio, the most relevant spatiotemporal scale is. So we have every stories that range from the subcellular to uh, graphical networks. Um, so we're still sort of having a, you know, a debate about that. Third bullet point, it seems like that we've got to concede now that there's probably more than one neural co correlate in any sense of the word of neural correlate for any specific conscious state like say visual awareness or for the field of consciousness at large. Um, why, why, did we, why do we have to conclude that? Because one of the things we've learned about in the last few decades is neuroplasticity, degeneracy, neural reuse and so on. So these are real life cases of multiple realizability of various sorts. Um, we've also learned that other animals and insects, which most people now would agree have some, what it's like to be, some phenomenal consciousness, uh, that they have radically different neural architectures and yet are also conscious. So if we're not restricting ourselves to mammals, then obviously this mechanism hunting thing becomes much more complicated. Next bullet point, we have the signal to noise problem. Again, we heard about that today. You can't, we don't know how to subtract the minimally sufficient conditions from necessary background and enabling conditions or from the neural consequences going forward. So trying to find the snapshot that is the minimally sufficient condition turns out to be very hard. We have this problem of trying to figure out diachronic versus synchronic correlates, right? Um, so since these are dynamical systems, it's probably a gross simplification to think that there's just some, you know, at time t, there is some neural correlate frozen in time that is responsible causally or otherwise for some snapshot of a, you know, a conscious experience that seems extremely naive. So here's the bottom line. As with genes and proteins and epigenomics, um, what we've learned is that key neural mental correlations are not going to be one-to-one. -one. And so that's going to obviously complicate the game of mechanism hunting. So in other words, whether allegedly necessary or sufficient, uh, sufficient conditions, especially going beyond mammals, there will possibly even be a many, many relationship between neural correlates and conscious states. All of this made the simplistic game of looking for an NCC a problem. Um, so, you know, we can also stop for a second and ask though, given the hard problem and given that these people were alleging they wanted to actually solve the hard problem, which is a big ask, you, we can, suppose they had, suppose they had the neural correlate, suppose they had the minimally sufficient condition, suppose they even had things they thought counted as unique mechanisms. That's not gonna solve the hard problem or the explanatory gap, right? Because the way the problem is set up, it's insoluble in this fashion or in, in terms of any physical explanation because the purveyor of the hard problem always gets to ask, but why that mechanism, right? But why that correlate? It's, it's an unwinnable game. So I think, in, I think in this way, the neuroscientists are right. This is a philosophically, a philosophically generated game that is empirically unwinnable. Um, so what do we do? It seems then that given the logic of the hard problem, 
we're stuck with things like strong emergence or panpsychism. And those are the very things that, you know, the biological naturalists hope to banish. So once we realized, people realized that this game of biological naturalism was not gonna go so smoothly, um, and people became skeptical about identity-based theories, then uh, new vistas were opened up. And even neuroscientists went back to these sort of more phenomenal conscious-based information sorts of models. I call it neo-functionalism. Sometimes it's information theoretic functionalism. Sometimes it's computational. But I'm talking here about IIT, GWT, FEP, there are others. And, uh, so people went, they, they, instead of looking for mechanisms, they started looking for principles, even people who had formerly been biological naturalists. It didn't take them very long to stop playing the game and start looking for a new one. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but that's just the way that it happened. But there's a problem here too, if you think you're tackling the hard problem, because functionalism doesn't get you out of the hard problem either. In other words, you, you know, again, the hard problem person keeps, to, keeps getting to ask, but you know, why that particular information construct or you know, whatever, right? It doesn't help. So that's why these views, in order to actually ever say anything about the hard problem, they easily end up invoking, invoking something like strong emergence or panpsychism anyway. Okay, so another way you can look at this, this is, this is some language that comes from Einstein. When he was trying to figure out special relativity, he wanted what he called the constructive or mechanical model of special relativity, something like the ether, for example. He tried in vain, if you look at the papers, he really, really wanted such an account. He was very mechanically minded physicist, believe it or not. And when he failed to do it, he was willing to look at what he called the principal explanation. So think about special relativity. You have the light postulate and you have the relativity principle. And then from that, you get everything you need to unify Newton and Maxwell, and you get an entire story, right, um, about Lorentz invariance and so on. But there's no mechanism there, there's no ether, there's nothing like that. And I, you can see that that's what these neuroscientists were trying to do, right? Instead of thinking about the mechanism, they're trying to think about the principle. And these theories give you different principles. But again, the bottom line is, if identity and weak emergence aren't gonna do the trick, what are we left with? So in the wake of all this, some of the things that have become more popular, panpsychism, strong emergence, dual aspect theories, neutral monism. Again, I'm not gonna go through all this, there's no time. What I would just point out is that, at least from my perspective, this is obviously a value judgment. The first two of these are simply patching physicalism or materialism, right? Um, to put it in a, a grossly unfair way, strong emergence is the idea that somehow conscious minds pop out of neurophysiological processes and whatever story or law that that would be about would now be a fundamental part of the universe. It's a gross violation of a sort of unified picture of the world, if that's what you're after. Panpsychism is a, is a it, it, people often don't think of it as a reductionist move, but it's the favorite move for the physicalist who can't believe in identity theory anymore, because at least they can say consciousness is part of fundamental physics. So now I take consciousness and I stick it in my fundamental physical base, and that becomes an axiomatic feature of the world. Okay. So again, that's Ravon Zhu also. The point is that these former biological naturalists now having, feels, feeling like biological naturalism, searching for the neural correlate, has not gotten, more, gotten them where they want. Um, they've moved back towards more sort of principled or information theoretic functionalist accounts. So there's an example of Kristoff talking about IIT, where he even talks about things like panpsychism. So you see Kristoff and other people, not just him, not only invoking these principal accounts, but trying to interpret them in terms of panpsychism or strong emergence or what have you. So unsurprisingly, I know that this is a, a head whipping historical episode because everything's happening very quickly here. Many of these former biological naturalists are very unhappy with this principle stuff, doesn't solve the hard problem. You're not getting any mechanisms. Most of these theories have fatal flaws or so I would say, though I have no time to, to back that up. So they wanna come back to biological naturalism. What do they do? Well, here's the move. So um, the, I think the best version of this, and this is what I'm sort of basing the talk on is a Neil Sess new book, 
uh, which by the way, even though I, I don't agree with all of it, is an, an extremely excellent book, gives a great overview of consciousness science and consciousness studies. But here's the move, this what I call neo-biological naturalism. So it has recently led many neuroscientists to reconceive of cognitive neuroscience as not being about resolving the hard problem or finding a minimally sufficient condition, but rather providing some mechanistic explanation by way of multiple necessary neuro conditions, neural correlates. In other words, something that we can at least use for manipulation and control and intervention. So again, good old fashioned biology. This is obviously a much humbler, more achievable take on the science of consciousness that focuses not on the hard problem, but on explaining very specific contents and states of conscious experience, including larger features such as the unity of consciousness, subjectivity, et cetera. But we're still mechanism hunting, right? That's just a more humble version of mechanism hunting. So again, the book I was telling you about, excellent book, nice explication of the sort of view I'm talking about here. Biological naturalism comes back. Here's how Anil puts it. The real problem is distinct from the hard problem because it's not about explaining why and how consciousness is part of the universe in the first place. It does not hunt for a special sauce that can magic consciousness for mere mechanism. It also distinct from the easy problems because it focuses on phenomenology rather than on function or behavior. So this is the game, the new game to be played, much like the old game, but again, much humbler. So this, continuing from the book, the challenge is to build increasingly sturdy explanatory bridges between mechanism and phenomenology so that the relations we draw on are not arbitrary but make sense. What does make sense mean in this context? Explain, predict, and control. The sort of thing you would often hear in a biological science. Um, by the way, there's nothing, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing this sort of science. So that's, it will become clear. I hope that's not the point. So what, what happens to the hard problem in this sort of, uh, approach. Well, um, again, here's what Seth says in his book. As we get on with explaining the various properties of consciousness in terms of their underlying mechanisms, perhaps the fundamental, fundamental mystery of how consciousness happens will fade away, just as the mystery of what is life also faded away. By the way, if we had more time, I would pursue that analogy in a critical way, but we don't. Um, but you get the idea. We don't have any idea what the origin of life is, but still we can work out mechanisms of stuff. And so the analogy here is we don't have any idea what the origin of consciousness is, but still we can work out some mechanisms. So that's the analogy. And then he says, importantly, the real problem of consciousness is not an admission of defeat to the hard problem. The real problem goes after the hard problem indirectly. Now, right here, you could start asking yourself, isn't this really an admission of defeat, right? Why isn't this an admission of defeat? Is it really true that if we work out some of these necessary conditions, some of these mechanisms where I can turn a dial or push a button, so to speak, and predictably make a transformation in consciousness, which of course is a lot of what biology is all about. Nothing wrong with that. Is it really true that the hard problem goes away? Well, why? why? I mean, go back to the premises I used to generate the hard problem. Did they deny any of those premises? It doesn't seem so. And if they didn't, then the hard problem is still with us. Now, which there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know what? The hard problem was insoluble to begin with. It doesn't help science, we're gonna move on. But then to say that and not say this sort of stuff is a much, you know, it's a much smaller thing to provide to consciousness studies in general, right? So you can see that part of the reason I'm doing this talk is you can see that like all scientists, understandably, neuroscientists really do want to, you know, have all the explanatory juice. And, Thinking about the brain as the central explanatory organ, it's understandable why they might feel that way. So the question then is what should we make of this new biological naturalism, right? We, what we wanna know here is, does it fare any better than the old biological naturalism? Are they really gonna give us something that goes beyond mere correlations that stand in need of further explanation? That's always the trick in science, right? Some, whatever, the, whatever the real explanation, quote unquote, or the deeper explanation looks like, it should be, it should be go, on, go beyond mere correlation. Um, so how are they gonna do that? Can they do that? So now we have to start asking some questions. Pava, how am I doing on time? Five minutes left. Five of my 20? Five of my 20. Okay, cool. If I keep talking, will it keep going up? Um, 
So questions, so I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna get through everything, but questions we can start asking. Um, you can look at those for yourself. Is the biological naturalism, is it just good metaphysically neutral science? Uh, is there any such thing? Is there any such thing as an explanation that counts as an explanation irrespective of any metaphysical background beliefs? Uh, does it really deflate the hard problem, et cetera, et cetera? So many questions. But here's what I wanna say. Here's the critical caveats that I wanna, I wanna bring up. Um, again, nothing wrong with playing this kind of game in science, subtract the hype, perfectly reasonable thing to do. But in terms of trying to you know, deal with the hype, here are the caveats I would wanna bring up. The first one is when it comes to alterations in the contents of conscious experience, it is not a brain-centric affair, but rather an embodied, embedded in biopsychosocial affair ranging across multiple spatial and temporal scales. So in other words, I'll make it clear exactly what I mean with an example in a second, but here's a, a visual representation. I would say the best way to think about people and in, in their conscious experiences is that they're part of a multi-scale network, which includes all kinds of biological, psycho and, and cultural sorts of things. So not as closed, you know, you know, windowless monads that are floating points of, conscious experience, right? That somehow are, you know, given to us by the brain. So when you look at things this way, there's gonna be a lot, a lot of ways to intervene in people's consciousness that will affect the content of their consciousness other than some neural mechanism. So let me give you an example. Um, we talk a lot about neural mechanisms for psychedelics in these conferences. Um, and psychedelics are a great example because it, it looks so straightforwardly simple, like, I dropped some acid and, you know, uh, now I really, really changed my consciousness. Nobody could deny that there is some sort of causal relationship there. But it's easy to forget the following when you do that. For thousands of years, humans have been drawn to consume hallucinogenic substances to deliberately alter states of consciousness. These drug-induced mental states frequently involve mystical experience, the dissolution of boundaries between self and world, changes of social emotional perceptive, and so on. The subjective alterations of reality are known to be highly variable across individuals. This variability of the nature of drug-induced experiences may depend on one's life history, worldview, set and setting, we all know this. Inter-individual variabilities pose a key challenge as we venture to bring hallucinogenic substances into medical practice. The same drug can induce boundless feelings of joy and love in some and terror and panic in others, right? And those of us who've been tripping for a while know exactly what this is all about. What, what's the point I'm trying to make here? Thank you. The point I'm trying to make here is even when it comes to tripping, right? Yes, you took a substance, you changed your brain. The sort of experience you have, even the same person tripping on the same substance in the same amount later, it's a multi-scale affair, including your mind as to what sort of experience you have. So the idea that the neural mechanism is the deepest and only and singular explainer of what you experience, even in this case is false. And again, this is just, um, philosophers have even started writing about this sort of stuff, about psychedelics, finally. Um, and the point that, that a lot of philosophers make here is, again, when you're thinking about using these things in therapy, the best predictor of whether or not somebody has a positive or a transformative experience, even in a therapeutic setting, is nothing to do with the dose or any of these sort of things that might be about the mechanism. It's about the conscious, meaningful experience that they had. In other words, you can't take the conscious meaning out of the story, right, to explain these transformative experiences. Uh, again, mechanism hunting, important thing to point out here, in the game of scientific explanation, understanding, prediction, control, and manipulation can all come apart, right? So uh, you might know how to manipulate and control something and not have the mechanism or vice versa. Think about people in Hindu or Buddhist traditions, shamanic traditions, psychonauts or whatever. They have mastered manipulating and controlling human consciousness for thousands of years, even now far better than a cognitive neuroscientist of consciousness, but they have no idea about the neural correlates or neural mechanisms. 
Last point, you can't turn mechanisms into explanations without metaphysics and epistemology at bottom. So choosing to focus on manipulation and intervention via mechanism hunting as fundamental explanation already presupposes some sort of reductive materialism and certain epistemic norms about explanation. So this is what, um, I'm probably over time, but just to give you a, a super obvious example, this little visual is about predictive processing or predictive coding, right? And this is where, for example, Anil tries to tell his master story about a mechanism in the brain. It's a predictive processing machine. You've heard that one a lot. You'll hear it a lot more. But look at the basis of that sort of view, right? Um, brains are, in this view, brains are the basic unit of existence. Everything else, both quote unquote, experientially external and internal are just virtual reality constructs of your brain. So really the world is a bunch of brains moving around in a noumenal physical environment that they don't know about, uh, cooking up virtual reality representations about that. Um, and then, you know, in other words, these are the brain's best interpretations of the signals that they're getting or what have you. So first of all, this view assumes representationalism with a capital R, right? Uh, you know, as opposed to any sort of direct realism. That is a huge metaphysical assumption that is not entailed by anything in science. They assume that floating brains are fundamental. Again, another huge metaphysical assumption. So um, that's it. The next part of my talk would have been how if you move to neutral monism, you can make the relationship between metaphysics and philosophy and neuroscience better. Thank you. I think we are now already, it's uh, 5.26, so we should move on and have the video of the next, and we will have questions, we can have questions then after, after the session and over the uh, uh, party or reception. So you'll, you'll have, but let's see if we can get through. Okay. Thanks for a great presentation. Okay, all right. That's you. Okay, so uh, so if there is a very quick question, you can may maybe maybe ask. Good job. Let's have yeah, Bill. You. Are you allowed to ask more questions? Yeah. Do you want to ask you? So I guess I should go back up there and answer people. Are you here? No. It's okay. Yeah, it's just asking you to. Um, explain a bit more the multi-scale thing because um, the, the first thing you would think of is if it, you're not brain-centric is to do dissociation. So you'd say, okay, there's the two, the bad trip and the good trip. The brain should be identical, right? Yeah. Uh, and But it won't be. Um, and so, yeah. So how does the multi-scale fit into this I think most people say, yeah, you're going to find a difference in the brain between the bad trip and the good trip. Right? You, you might find a difference in the brain between the, the bad trip and the good trip, um, but it might not be a huge explanatory difference. Um, and, and here's the most important thing I would say. Um, the question we really want to know is, but why is that difference there, right? And the story for that difference in the brain might not be bottom up, but it might be multi-scale top down including, you know, what's going on with you psychologically, socially, and so on. Can I also ask a quick question about uh, what do you think is the relation between panpsychism and uh, this uh, dual aspect theories? Aren't, is there, isn't there a way of seeing that they would be actually quite close? I don't think so. But again, these terms are used in such heterogeneous ways I'm, I'll just tell you how I keep them apart in my head. So panpsychism is defined as follows, that whatever is physically fundamental, strings, loops, whatever, uh, there's some subjectivity, however, unlike ours associated with it, and that you have to build that up to make beings such as ourselves. Dual aspect theory says that there's, at bottom, there's something that's, that's metaphysically neutral, but it has two aspects, a mental and a physical aspect. And just as the word suggests, they are not identifiable. They are truly non-dual, but there's some story about how they get correlated. 
So these strikes me as as distinct views. Yeah, you know, it's just interesting because uh, we had this workshop yesterday, and I think, for example, in the case of Bohm's, he has a kind of dual aspect. But the way he defines is that wherever you make a cut in reality, where, wherever you point to, you will find two aspects. And that is, of course, a bit like panpsychism, because even if you take an electron, in his case, he would have the information field for the particle. So you would have the two aspects there. But anyway, that was just. You're right. I, I, I just, the two uh, aspect part is the same, right? So the fundamental particles or whatever, there are two aspects there. Um, but the dual aspect theorist is not committed to that, that dual aspect being, you know, stuck at the bottom. Right, right. right. That makes sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I, but there might be versions of dual aspect that get quite close to panpsychism in, in, to something. But of course, then the question is whether you will have, I think in the case of Bohm, he, he would talk more about the physical and the mental. And I think for him, consciousness would come up only at the very, some, you know, like human beings. So in a way, right. it's not panpsychism in a strong sense, but some, some anyway. Right, gotcha. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Do we still have? Or do you want to start it? Let me start the video. Okay, so here we go for the next. Uh... So the video uh, presentation is by Ali Akbar Kochak Zadeh and a co author Sharia Karib Zahed. Zadeh. And the abstract title would be The Nature of Human Reports and the Possibility of Harness of the Meta Problem. So, Meta Problem of Consciousness, like it's a question of, for example, why don't everybody agree that there is a heart problem? Come on. theoretical studies at Institute for Cognitive and Brain Sciences from Tehran, Iran. I should thank my dear mentor, who I did this work under his supervision, a Professor Shahriyar Qaribzadeh. Uh, the subject of the presentation is this, nature of human reports and possible hardness of the meta problem. So let's begin. First, let's, uh, let, let's have an of overview on what I will talk about. In the first part, I will present an introduction to the hard and metal problems of consciousness. In the second part, I will address my first point that is the nature of human reports. That is summarized in this question. Are human reports intuitions? And in the third part, I will address my second point that is possible hardness of the meta problem. That is summarized in this question. Is the meta problem an easy problem? So, an introduction to the heart problem and the meta problem of consciousness is the first subject that I'm going to talk about. Before anything, we should make clear what we mean from subjective experience. The concept of subjective experience is traditionally owed to the Thomas Nagel's famous notion of what it is like to be. I'm going to talk about this notion. In the Nagel's view, we can say a being is conscious only if there is something that it is like to be that being. Now, I bring examples from Chalmers' 1998 article for being, some, being something that it is like to be that thing. First, the false quality of redness meets 
Nagel's criterion. The experience dark and light is another example. Or for example, the quality of depth in a visual film. A very close concept to the Nagel's what it is likeness is phenomenal state that happens in phenomenal consciousness. Phenomenal states are qualitative states that are experienced by a phenomenally conscious creature. These states have experiential properties such as raw sensory feelings, for example, redness of a square, that is the thing that is named as quail and its plural form is qualia. Phenomenal consciousness is the overall structure of experience and involve far more than sensory qualia. Phenomenal consciousness is the experience itself. Let's address Chalmers' famous 1995 article, Facing Up to the Problem of Consciousness. Chalmers in this article says, there is nothing that we know more intimately than conscious experience. And explaining this conscious experience is the hardest thing. When talking about the concept of consciousness, he directly confronts to its problems. He made a separation between easy problems and the hard problem. Easy problems are problems that seem solvable with the standard methods of cognitive science, such as computational or neuronal mechanism approaches. These problems are problems of explaining, for example, the integration of information by a cognitive system, the reportability of mental states, the differences between wakefulness and sleeping, and etc. These easy problems are associated with the notion of consciousness, but they are not all of the notion of consciousness. On the other hand, there is also a hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem is the problem that resists to be solved by current methods of cognitive science. The hard problem is the problem of experience or the problem of explaining subjective experience. It is based on this statement, explaining brain functions does not lead to explaining experience. Some could ask, what does it mean? The answer is, the hard problem persists even the, per, the, the performances of all the relevant functions are explained. Here is an example from Chalmers' article. To explain reportability is just to explain how a system could perform the function of producing reports on internal states. But I should add this notion. This, ex this explanation of the function of a system is just an explanation of functions. It does not say anything about the associated phenomenal states. All of these ideas about the heart problem are explanandum. That means the heart problem is just a call for explanation. It does not explain anything itself. Let's go to the meta problem of consciousness. According to Chalmers, the meta problem of consciousness is the problem that why do we think there is a hard problem of consciousness? As Chalmers said in his 2018 article, the meta problem is the problem about problem. He suggests that we should explore problem reports, 
the reports that we make when we face the hard problem of consciousness. As Chalmers introduced, problem reports or phenomenal reports or reports about phenomenal states are facts of human behavior. And because of that, they can be solved by methods used for easy problems. A point is that the problem reports are made from verbal reports, judgments, and dispositions to make reports and judgments. Therefore, the nature of problem reports in the Chalmers' view are, are these I have mentioned. That means verbal reports, judgments, and disposition to make reports and judgments. The subject matter of those reports are phenomenal states. In simple words, they are about phenomenal states. We have a quote here from the Chalmers' 2018 article that is, I read it. The meta problem of explaining them is strictly speaking, one of the easy problems of consciousness. So in the Chalmers' view, the meta problem is an easy problem. This is one of the points that we focused on in this presentation. Chalmers goes further and introduce problem intuitions that are intuitions about the hard problem of consciousness. Problem intuitions may be defined as dispositions to make problem reports and problem judgments. Chalmers thinks that problem intuitions can be explained in functional terms. Therefore, explaining them is easy. The second part of our presentation is this idea, to question the nature of human reports. Are human reports intuitions or they are more? Let's start thinking about it. Consider a verbal report about the heart problem. It will be something like this. I think there is a heart problem. When a participant says it, the condition that the meta problem is seeking for is satisfied. I think there is a heart problem. So I made some judgments and I have this mental state that yes, there is an explanatory gap. There is something that, that I cannot understand. It is hard. I think there is a heart problem. So when a participant, for example, in an experimental study, think and reports like that, our condition is satisfied. So we think that there is a question here. What happened just in that event? What happened in that report? This is the question. This is the question we are trying to answer. We think that being thoughtful about the nature of those reports is reasonable. The reason behind this thoughtfulness is this. With summarizing the fact of human reports in the notion of intuitions, we will eliminate some aspects of reality. When a human makes a problem report, she does not just have intuitions but also she has some other aspects of reality, such as thoughts and concurrent phenomenal states. We are trying to introduce these aspects in the next slide. When a person reaches to the answer that yes, I think there is a hard problem, there might be some previous thoughts about this subject that is not happen in this moment, in, in this particular intuition. So we think that previous contacts with the subject make memory of thought. 
The mentioned memory affects intuitions itself. This is the point that we think should not be eliminated. On the other hand, there are also concurrent conceptual phenomenal states in the moments of answering. When a person answers the question that, is there a heart problem? He thinks at that moment. I emphasize, he thinks at that moment. He has conceptual phenomenal states in that particular moment. So we think that these states are not intuitions. Here are two options in front of us. First, these states are not intuitions that we, we have chosen. And second, these states are intuitions. If we agree with the second option, we are applying that there is not a heart problem of consciousness and, the, and there are not phenomenal states. So we agree with the first option. As a person who shares sympathy with the heart problem of consciousness, I should do that. So let's go to the second idea I will present here. Is the metal problem an easy problem? The question is this, and my answer is at, at this moment is, it is possibly not. So what reasons I have for this answer? Let's talk about it. So the idea that we are pursuing is to leave open the possibility for hardness of the meta problem. Why do we have this aim? It seems that assuming meta problem as an easy problem will not lead to a satisfying explanation for subjective experience. We think that there should be a complete picture of what happens in a single report. This complete picture should contain the existence of phenomenal states during a single problem report. When a person makes a problem report, in those moments, if we want to have a complete picture considering phenomenal states, we should know that in those moments, there are both phenomenal states and intuitions or other behavioral or functional terms be used. Both of them exist. Another question that rises here is, what are the value of phenomenal states in a satisfying, in a, in a satisfying explanation? Explaining brain functions re related to the meta problem does not lead to explain them, means phenomenal states. So in our opinion, the position that the metal problem of consciousness poses is a hard problem because it is not solved when we explain its related brain functions. And we think that the metal problem remains. So if a problem remains while you answer it with functional terms, what does it mean? We think that it means that the meta problem is a hard one. Thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for being with me in this presentation. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to be with you at the Tosan Science of Consciousness conference. I should say goodbye now and preparing myself for question and answer session. Thank you uh, and goodbye. Okay, Here, there's one question. Yeah, Uti, please. You can hear me? Yes, I, uh, I can. My, my question is, it seems like you're suggesting that the smart 
AI as smart as it can be cannot pass the Turing test. And I wonder what question would you ask a, an AI to stomp it in the Turing test? It seems like you're, you're suggesting that certain questions about acquaintance uh, are, are uh, there, there'll be some differences between how a machine responds and how a human would, would respond. So yeah, th this is the question. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes, um, I, I, I think there is a difference uh, uh, because I have a, a, a subjective knowledge that th there is a consciousness uh, and I'm, I'm not a computer. Uh, uh, if if I were, uh, uh, it, it it would be plausible to say that, but I, I cannot uh, answer it. Um, so uh, I, I I think um, uh, uh, when when we 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 think uh, of thinking as an uh, as as a phenomenal aspect, uh, uh, we we should reach th this point that the metal problem can be hard. Uh, so uh, I, I'm sorry if I uh, couldn't answer completely. Uh... Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we should uh, move on to the next. So do we have uh, Richard Gill here? And, and so and are you ready to go? Yeah, I've got his presentation loaded. He's just got to come up. Excellent. So anyway, let's let's thank once more our, our previous presenter. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to talk to you about the uh, evolution of the explanatory gap and um, see where that leads to. Um, the explanatory gap has been thought about and uh, discussed for some quite some decades now. Um, it's really thought on the whole that um, it, uh, it was Levine who started off this discussion and the gap as he thought it was the, the gap that existed between our physical and philosophical ideas about the idea and our, our uh, experiences, qualia and our personal experiences, for the phenomenological experiences. Since, since then, Colin McGinn has suggested somewhat uh, pessimistically that uh, our cognitive abilities are really very, very limited indeed. And there are both scientific and philosophical problems that we humans will never be able to solve. Um, this is a rather restricted point of view, but um, it can be believed in the sense that in the big wide world with the, in the animal kingdom and people who are not exposed to philosophy, uh, that uh, they, they cannot understand really what's going, going on. And then the most well-known and perhaps uh, most uh, prevalent view is the view of uh, David Chalmers, who thinks that uh, the hard problem of consciousness, you're all right? The hard problem of con consciousness, which everyone is very familiar with, is, is the problem of experience. And in particular, why don't physical experiences give rise to an inner life at all? The idea is that uh, there's nothing really particularly about the physical world that uh, implies that there ought to be a mental world as well. Let's just see if I can go the right way, if I can remember it. No, that's the wrong way. Um, the general approach that I'm taking is that uh, what I call arrangements are the thing that are important. I've uh, thought of the idea that everything you can consider is an arrangement of some sort. So the arrangements of great hierarchies from atoms, cells, molecules, and so on, and uh, to us, and these are in a, a sort of stacked process. And the top arrangement, if you're ever considering it, is, is the arrangement itself. And um, any arrangement, of course, is, is an arrangement of other things. But the, this idea also applies to all things that are mental as well. 
And uh, if you accept this idea that arrangements are the thing, this removes the uh, extension, the uh, concept of, uh, of monism and uh, other uh, traditional philosophical views. And um, if everything is, is an arrangement, it uh, also resolves the mind-matter in interaction process, which is bedeviled, for example, well, um, dualism. The idea that uh, of the arrangements is that everything in the world that we know, know about is uh, an arrangement of some sort. And I've sat here, uh, at the top I've got the mind, and the bottom that goes down into via neurons, molecules, particles, and electrons. It goes down to quarks and strings. And at the bottom of this uh, great stack of different things, things uh, ultimately the physical scientists don't know what's at the bottom of it. There's still debate about that. And so at the bottom of all these things, there's uh, what can be called a sea of ignorance, which is po possibly something in uh, 10 or, or 12, 11 different dimensions. But uh, one of the, so every, every, these arrangements are different to each other at the top and the bottom, uh, in that at the bottom, we don't know what's going on. At the top, there's nothing over and above what's uh, there. And uh, although that's composed of things further down in the, in the ar arrangement stack, it isn't actually uh, the same as that. It's something, something of itself, which is separate from all of its components. And uh, the other thing is that uh, the, are uh, sets of laws that apply to this, this uh, set of uh, different, different sorts of things. Uh, in the bottom region of this, of particles and molecules and so on, this is all very well understood by physics. And um, there are sets of different laws that apply at that level. Uh, and at lower levels, there's things that are called quarks and so on. But the laws that apply to these different levels don't necessarily apply to the higher levels. Uh, so that, for example, our bodies and tables and chairs, there's, although they uh, are arrangements of molecules and atoms and so on, they, uh, they, they're not, uh, not sub subject to the laws of these, that everything goes on at the higher level is compatible with the lower levels, but isn't necessarily, well, it isn't at all implied by the lower level, and that applies to neurons. What happens in neurons is compatible with uh, the behavement of the cells and atoms and, and so on, but uh, what happens is not implied by the laws. So there's different sets of levels, including up to the mental level, where there are the laws, as it were, of their own, which don't uh, necessarily apply lower, lower down. So if you know everything about neurons, you don't know what's happening in a, in a particular person's mind. Um, the example I quote about the different sorts of arrangements you can have are of golf clubs, that uh, you can have golf clubs of two different sorts. You can have uh, the sort that uh, contains putters and drivers and golf balls and, golf balls and so on. Or you can be talking about the rules of the game uh, together with what goes on in the club, clubhouse, the etiquette and so on and so forth. And although the clubs themselves you might think of as physical objects and that they apply the, uh, the rules of science, uh, the, the latter sub, uh, concepts of club rules and so on are not objects of physics. Uh, they're not incompatible with the objects of physics. You can't have anything in your rule, rules of the club that uh, uh, violates the laws of physics, but um, they're not implied. The rules are not implied and laws are not implied by the, the structure of science. And that applies to all of the higher level things, which are not obviously physical. So the conclusion of this is that um, I reject quite a lot of med medical metaphysical ideas and don't continence the dualism, physicalism, mysterism, panpsychism, and no doubt many others that uh, are, uh, have proponents. Uh, getting on now to our limitations as human beings, 
We accept restrictions on our physical capabilities, but we don't seem to be so keen on accepting uh, the limitations of our mental abilities and the limits to our method of source thoughts. Uh, for example, we cannot fly. Nobody seems to be bothered about that particularly, and we accept that, but we cannot understand consciousness. So there's a whole series of problems in, in the mental domain that we feel that we cannot understand. And uh, within this background of uh, what we've just gone through, I want to uh, suggest that our difficulty in understanding the explanatory gap which exists between our experience and what we can uh, recognize as our mental abilities is um, that this gap is uh, what we need to try and understand why there is a gap, uh, why, what the reasons for it are, and uh, whether or not we can uh, overcome, ever overcome this limit and uh, whether we can properly understand the nature of the gap. The, uh, this is a sort of somewhat historical point of view. The, the gap, I think, originates in the transition from animals to human beings, uh, or in the difference between the two. Because animals can communicate uh, with each other, uh, for example, animals know how to find each other's to breed and uh, have offspring and so on, build nests and birds and so on. Uh, they, they cannot talk to each other, although they can communicate with each other. And although it's, there's no direct proof, it's not conceivable that, um, that, that, emerge, that consciousness actually emerges is in the transition from animals to human beings that at some point or other that, uh, although perhaps we didn't have the ability of language, uh, we weren't different in our, some of our mental abilities from those of human beings. And for example, at least according to Darwin and, and others, animals can experience and express emotions uh, quite uh, readily. And uh, these are similar to us. If you think of an angry bear proceeding towards you, it's difficult to believe it doesn't, uh, isn't able to express its emotions even to uh, human beings. Uh, however, without the use of language, the gap cannot be considered. And um, it's only become an object of contemplation quite recently, since firstly the development of speech a long time ago and philosophy, which was uh, more recent, but still a long time ago, but our present day difficulties with the gap have arisen really uh, since speech was able to uh, express itself in abstract th thoughts. And the gap that emerged was between what can or cannot be completely understood. We can uh, understand some things, but uh, there are other things which we don't understand, but we can't really express very clearly what, what those are. And the reason this arises is because of uh, the limits we have on communication. Some things we can communicate directly with each other and in, in an exact way. An example of that is uh, numbers. If the number two, for example, uh, I can communicate that directly uh, to you and you can understand it. And there is, isn't an experience aspect to that. There is an experience to the number of two. You can experience two objects, but the abstract number itself, you cannot uh, uh, communicate. But other things that, um, uh, that we might talk about are really very, very inexact. And in particular, that um, it's not possible for me to express my experience in a way that it reproduces in, in your own minds. Uh, for example, I've viewed this conference room from up here and can see you in, in the audience. And uh, although you know what I mean, I cannot uh, reproduce the view from here in your minds only. I can only just uh, suggest it. You can imagine uh, what it's life like, but you can't, uh, you can't, I can't actually pass on the experience to you. 
And this also corresponds, in my view, to the division between science and art. In science, you can pass on things exactly that uh, the concepts are transmitted to one and all, and people don't agree to them. In the arts, the, uh, the, the views are not passed on exactly and are dependent on uh, people's experience and interpretation of the arts. Uh, and as an example of exact and inexact communication, consider the, the uh, talking about a tiger. The word part of that is exact. Uh, I can pass that on, you can write it down. It's exactly the same as me. But the experience part of it is different, that um, different people will have different experiences of their, their lives and uh, they won't all correspond to each other, although there's a commonality between the different exper experiences of tiger. But if I uh, utter the word tiger, when I can see a tiger, this will not, re and you can't see a tiger, this will not recreate in your mind the same experience as me. So there's a gap between what I can see, what I can talk about and what you can understand. And the gap between the two is, uh, is language dependent. Um, it's interesting to try to inquire what might cause this bandwidth of communication. And uh, it can be understood really by uh, analysis of the different human, human communication, human communications that we, we have. If you talk on the telephone or listen to uh, speech on the TV, this requires a bandwidth of several kilohertz. That's uh, the amount of information that is needed to uh, express this, uh, the speech. If on the other hand, you look at uh, an image on uh, TV or uh, other media of that sort, but it requires a huge uh, larger bandwidth. It's something like a thousand times as much bandwidth. And if you try to produce an image of uh, a picture on TV, it would take you uh, uh, more than 17 minutes to try to reproduce it in the oral channel to reproduce it in the visual channels, even, even if you're vi visually wired up to do this, which we're not, of course. But it means that uh, the speech has got a much uh, lesser scope for uh, expressing things than, uh, than the visual channel is able to absorb. And it follows from this that uh, we can experience visual things, but uh, we can't communicate them properly. We can communicate them to a minor degree, but uh, we can't uh, do anything like a complete experience of it, simply, simply because there's the scope of our uh, communication abilities is very, is very limited compared with uh, what we're able to see. Um, this gap then gives an opportunity for the development of the arts, and it points out, out where they split off from science, uh, so that uh, in the arts, you try to express uh, the means at your disposal to produce sensations in people's ideas over and above what you can create yourself. So if you're reading a novel, for example, various things will become, come into your mind, which will have been produced by the artists, but they're not produced entirely uh, independently of the artists and produced partly uh, what, by what's put in front of you, and partly because by your experience. This is quite different from uh, science, and it's where things, particularly mathematics, uh, concentrate on those things that can be uh, exactly described, described and communicate to, uh, to other people. So we're now left in the experience, according to this, of having experience that you cannot adequately describe and this is a result of language being additional uh, to our general repertoire and the flow, the poor flow of information and from, experience, uh, from language to experience. That is, 
is there's a huge repertoire of going on and experiencing things and uh, going on all, all the time and exchange of experiences and things, but we cannot uh, reproduce these in, in each other. And this, this is where the gap is, and there's no escape for this. And it seems that, uh, that Colin McGinn is probably right about this for the uh, reasons which I've, I have mentioned. So my conclusion is that um, everything is arrangement that we know about, uh, apart from the very uh, deepest parts of physics or the smallest parts of space-time, um, which exist, for example, in the early universe, but they actually also exist in this, this room if you go to very small well, uh, time sequences and very small distances. So that's the first thing, that uh, everything is arrangements. And this, this includes everything that goes on in your mind and everything you can think of. So there isn't then a mental divide between uh, what, uh, what goes on in our minds and what goes on in other parts of our body. But we cannot create experiences in, in others. We, we can have experience ourselves, but we can't, it, uh, we can't create these into, into other people simply because our limitations of communication and, uh, for example, qualia can't be adequately described and are outside the repertoire of science, for example, feeling warm or experience colour. We can, in those cases, that uh, those are outside. So my message is let's enjoy our experiences, but uh, only allow uh, the arts and poets to uh, recreate them and for, for us to enjoy. So there, I've written a book about this and there's more details of that in, in this. And uh, at that point, I'd like to thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Well, I, I see the explanatory gap uh, that's arising really in what we can communicate to uh, other people. Um, if you look at certain, uh, for example, certain parts of science, there isn't an explanatory gap because we can communicate all that's necessary about the science subject to other people and we're not going to be puzzled with each other. But if you look in, in practically all our other levels and all the majority of what might call uh, general human experience, we can't communicate that to each other, however, however hard we try. And um, this means that, uh, that in trying to get and develop ideas of consciousness and theories of them, we're trying to uh, explain something which, which we can't actually, or include in our theory, something which we can't actually explain to other people. Right. But I guess the more traditional way of understanding the explanatory gap would be, you see, we could say that, well, there's a sense in which we do understand the physical, we can talk about the physical world and, and, yeah. uh, and, and you know, neural correlates of consciousness. And then we can also talk about our conscious experiences. I mean, you know, there's the phenomenology, introspection. Not, I understand it, the, that, you know, the not completely, but, but somehow I, I, I feel that maybe the explanatory gap is how do we relate these two stories, well, which is, I see is not so much about 
me trying to convey my experience to you, but rather trying to, you know, there's the gap between our understanding of the physical world and our understanding of the phenomenal world. So what, what, what is your take on that? Well, this is where I think the science comes into it and where the science can really only go so far. And with my idea of the hierarchy of different things above the sciences, is that as you go gradually up this, this route, you uh, en end up at different levels with diff different uh, laws and different interpretations as to what can happen. And they're not necessarily that uh, they're compatible with the lower levels of uh, what's going on, but they're, they're not explicable to the lower levels. So that when you get up to the top level of experience, things going on, in, in the mind, that, that is a top level above which there isn't anything else. The other levels of uh, the other levels in the hierarchy is something above and something below, except at the very bottom and the very top. And I think that's where the confusion arises. Okay. Okay. So anybody else, please? Hi, thank, <laughs> thank you for your talk. Um, I agree with you that science has limitations, but it does seem to me that we all agree that consciousness exists. The question is, what is the nature of it? And science finds that it has limits in everything, even things we can describe quite well, which we find out in quantum mechanics or what is the nature of light or even matter itself. So my question is why would we think science can't inquire into consciousness um, while acknowledging that there are limitations in what we can, can achieve? Yeah, so I think this is again due to my idea of uh, there being a hierarchy of science and that um, the things that are further above the, the, uh, the hierarchy uh, are all sorts of things, even before we get talking about uh, uh, the mind or anything. There are all sorts of things which are not subject to the, the laws of science at all. You can know everything about physics, for example, and uh, not really know what the different sort of species of animals are. That um, That's not something, uh, say the different species of animals, that's compatible uh, with science and there's nothing in there that is uh, in contradiction with the science. And similarly, the mind, I cannot see really that there is anything that can be pointed to that is actually in contradiction to the mind. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank, thank you very much again. Thanks. Uh, then uh, we move on, on to our next uh, speaker who is uh, Stephen Dace. Or dice from University of California at San Diego. Please. There we go. Sorry, I was muted. Okay. Uh, my name is Steve Dice. I'm from UC San Diego. I work in neurocomputation, an example of which here is on the left. And the title of my talk is, so is there something it is like or not? Mr. Dice, I apologize to interrupt. Uh, your screen share needs to be fixed. So is there a way okay. you can actually put it in full presentation mode? Um, I thought I had. Let me do that again. Yeah. Uh, there it is. Does that look right? Uh, we don't see anything yet. Okay. Um, let me uh, start over. Yeah. Does that work now? 
Still not seeing anything. You had originally had it up. You just didn't have it in full screen. It was. Okay. All right. Let me uh, do the share all over again. Okay. And now I'll try the full screen again. Correct. Go up to your view. Click on the. On the view. Well, yeah, I, I already. You're still not seeing it full screen. No, not seeing it full screen. Um, go to your view right there. Click on the view icon. Uh, sorry, there was no view icon on my uh, full screen view. Um, let's yeah, try this. See where it says home, insert, design, animation, slideshow, your top left, which is. Okay, yeah. so that's. Yeah, I was clicking on the one at the bottom right of the screen to do that. Yeah, that's fine. Just start from beginning. Let's see. But it didn't work there. Um, I go to your from yeah. beginning. Let's see if this works. No, still not doing it. Still not doing it. Okay, well let's let's just go with the the. Uh, go back. Can you take your so, uh, cursor and actually extend your uh, window there? So grab your. Well, um, I don't want to hold everything up. Uh, can okay. you see this screen here? Yeah, we can see it, and that's good enough. Okay, that might be good enough then. Let's use that. Uh, I don't know what the problem is. I've used this a million times. But uh, anyway, um, as I was saying, uh, is, there, is there something that's like or not? The real problem of physicalism. Uh, science and engineering are about prediction and control, respectively, as well as the blend of the two. In science, we seek to know how, when, and why things happen in the sequences they do. We look for consistent sequences and correlations, repeated patterns in our observations. Consistencies are summarized as laws of nature, yielding theories for prediction in all the sciences. In engineering, the goal is to use these predictive principles and the methods they spawn in order to create beneficial technologies. Daniel Seth in his recent book, Being You, along with many others in recent decades, has provided an overview of how our brains are prediction machines. I'll begin with a brief and speculative summary of how evolution shaped us for prediction from a neuroscience perspective, starting from the Cambrian explosion. This will show how we approach science of consciousness too narrowly and with bad assumptions, which create the hard problem, and it'll suggest a way out. The story begins with how and why we got these so-called beast machine skills, as Seth calls them. Since before the Cambrian explosion, about 550 million years ago, animals and plants have been co-evolving. Over millennia, there were periods of famine and scarcity. Animals often found it was necessary to eat each other uh, and other complex prey animals to survive, not just simple slow moving organisms or stationary plants. Since prey animals are moving targets, predators need to be able to anticipate where they're going, keep track of where they are themselves, and calculate an intercept path by control of their own body. They had to implicitly separate themselves from the environment over which there is no direct control. The evolutionary advantage went to those with brain circuits supporting egocentric points of view. This perspective was the foundation for simple self-experience. Every predator could also be a prey, the same skills serve to anticipate the actions and maneuvers of the predators that would likewise take them down. They had to anticipate the intentions of others, a, a primitive theory of mind for both their prey and the predators they avoided. So there was a double selection pressure for such skills. Once operant and classical conditioning ability evolved, animals could learn where danger lay and escape routes and maneuvers that work. They were freed from survival by reflex. Further advantage came from evolution of larger associative memory. They learned to associate some things with consequences. Combining that with the egocentric maps enabled episodic memory, enhancing the sense of continuity of a self. Many species found further advantage in numbers, creating groups for hunting and for defense. That led to the need to signal each other for coordination when hunting or defending, which created the impetus for vocalization, gestures, and language formation. As groups grew larger and more interdependent, it led to specialized roles in the social group. Some of those special roles, one of those special roles was farming and domestication, 
which got people interested in the seasons and predicting rain and the best times to plant and harvest crops and breed, breed livestock. Spears and clubs were followed by wheels and plows among the first technologies. Farmers might be considered among the first experimentalists with their crops and tending their animals. Cooperative individuals with respect for others had a better chance of avoiding ostracism and staying protected and finding mates to pass along their genes. Ultimately, there evolved cultural and hierarchical social structures we find today in social contract-based forms of government. From a neuroscience point of view, simple reinforcement learning was enabled by the brain's reward systems, including the dopamine system of the basal ganglia, the nucleus accumbens, and the amygdala. When this reptilian system became more coupled with the expanding multimodal associative cortex, it made possible abstract secondary reinforcers. That allowed a crude form of thinking ahead with anticipation and ultimately to planning ahead. For planning ahead to be viable, more abstract and indirect forms of feedback based upon prediction error evolved. When combined with the allocentric maps of the hippocampus and its precursors, animals acquired environmental maps to plan with and ability to consider alternatives. Now, environments, food sources, and mating opportunities and threats change on a faster time scale than genes can evolve. So the advantage went to those animals that evolved lifelong learning habits and family structures to pass down survival skills. Some species evolved cultures and social hierarchies beyond the family unit until they began to dominate the landscape. They evolved technologies taking them to the next level by not only adapting to their environment, but also adapting the environment to themselves. Humans became so successful that we threatened Earth's ecological balance. Before there were humans, there were millions of generations of animals who performed tasks with homologous or functionally identical brain structures. Hunting goes deep in our genome. Now that we have complex societies with factory farming, rich social interactions and media to find matching mates, one might think that our hunting skills are no longer as important. That would be a naive conclusion. Modern humans continue on the hunt for solutions, truths, sources of entertainment, better investments, and more secure places to live. All languages are rich with metaphors about hunting, searching, exploring, avoiding, evading, and grasping with our minds. Lakoff and Johnson have revealed many metaphors that we live by in their book, and developed, it was developed further in Philosophy in the Flesh by George Lakoff. Doug Hofstadter amplified this insight in his book, Surfaces and Essences. Analogy and metaphor are major challenges for systems like Siri, Alexa, and Google Home, partly because they lack embodiment. And robotics is not sophisticated enough yet to fill that gap. The importance of an analogical reasoning may seem like the pinnacle of intelligence, but it has been there all along at all levels of cognition in the wild. I use the term analogy to include simile and metaphor because they all derive from the same skill, the ability to compare different things and see similarities. Higher organisms have ability to generalize over instances based upon similarity and ignore irrelevant detail. The similarity is along dimensions of relevance or interest. The simpler life forms inherit the ability to recognize some dangers or nutrients. The more advanced learn with flexible associative cognition. One key difference between simple systems like planaria or insects and com complex systems like us, all of which live by pattern recognition, is that more complex systems can use representations learned by generalization from their sensory experiences. About 550, after about 550 million years, along comes the neuroscientists who would understand the nature of consciousness by, figuratively speaking, hunting for the correlates of phenomenal states and measurable brain events or processes. Seth argues for this, calling it the real problem of consciousness, in contrast to the hard problem of consciousness expressed by David Chalmers. Neuroscientists now have powerful experimental techniques to use for, for this writing on centuries of success, developing predictive theories in chemistry, biochem, genetics, and technologies like multi-electrode implants, fluorescent dyes, control over neuron ion channels, uh, things like electroencephalography, MEG, TMS, MRI, functional MRI, and diffusion tensor imaging for some examples. 
There are exciting times in neuroscience where interesting data is accumulating at an unprecedented rate. Theories in science require going beyond observations by inference, which is basically a method for predicting other observations. However complex the experimental apparatus, the experimenter has to read the data and interpret it, or read the results of experiments of others and interpret those. This requires use of the experimenter's senses and their memory to interpret what they're observing and its implications. Logical implications are, again, predictions that can be inferred from accepted beliefs. Consider one of the simplest observations, the time on an analog wall clock. To tell the time, one must distinguish the marks on the clock face along with the position of the minute and hour hands. These are often black on a white background. If there were no such color contrast, one could not tell time. It is the contrast between sensations like colors that inform us. To detect a change in time requires a record or on paper or in memory. This record is not changing by virtue of having more inertia than the clock hands. The third thing required is an interpretation of the change by comparison between the current reading and the recorded time to detect a change implying the passage of time. So there are three common elements to an observation or any memorable experience, the sensations, the memories, and the interpretation. All three require recognition through analogy detection, the clock hands, the numerals, and a remembered clock experience or record while glossing over changes in orientation, lighting, or perspective. When the philosopher of consciousness says, quote, there is something it is like, he or she is implicitly comparing phenomenal qualities for similarity using memory. It is the same skill that enables analogical comparison. Without sensing qualitative distinctions and comparing to memories to get interpretations, there can be no empiricism, much less eliminative materialism. You cannot deny the importance of qualia without either self-contradiction or denying any chance of ever knowing anything. We're unable to see, hear, taste, smell, or feel exactly what someone else is experiencing. We can only measure correlates. David Chalmers has dubbed this the hard problem because there's no scientific proof that anyone is actually having an experience except by virtue of reporting it. And the report could, in principle, be a lie or a zombie robot response. Seth argues that we should use the tools of neuroscience to induce and or measure the brain events that correlate with the, these reported experiences in order to make some progress. He suspects that the hard problem will dissipate as the correlations become tighter. We should not worry about this hard problem right now, if ever. Recall the Solvay conference debates and the birth of quantum theory Nearly 100 years ago, generations of physicists were taught to shut up and calculate because the theory gave accurate predictions. Technologies advanced immensely proceeding this way, leaving only a handful of physicists and philosophers to ponder what reality could underlie the calculations. Seth's position is analogous, and I call it shut up and correlate. Incidentally, correlating the structure of experiences to structure and brain activity is analogical. If we can predict and control conscious reports, he views that as advancement enough in neuroscience of consciousness for now. Many of us will not be satisfied with the state of affairs, similar to the many people perplexed by quantum theory. Most neuroscientists are like Seth and view consciousness as something that emerges in nervous systems. The idea of panpsychism, that consciousness could be a fundamental aspect of nature, is useless to them because it does not so far result in any predictions or controllable experiments. This is a natural conclusion coming from the latest generation of modern day hunter gatherers who see everything through the filter of a brain optimized for predicting and controlling. Is there no other way to look at this vexing predicament? Yes, there is. And it's based upon the one key feature of the natural conscious mind that makes science itself possible. To understand consciousness place in nature, we have to transcend our evolutionary inbred knack for looking at things like predators and use the more fundamental skill that prediction and control derive from, the ability to recognize patterns by seeing similarities and to think in analogies using memory. The universe is full of systems that cannot speak to us give, and give unambiguous reports in a language that we can understand. 
For centuries, animals were treated like robot machines with no feelings or no conscious awareness. Insects still are. A forum of scientists 10 years ago signed on to a declaration of consciousness beyond humans and many species at the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness in 2012. Getting past that bias is only a first step. If you want a real eye opener, take a look at the perceptual and cognitive skills of the little jumping spider known as Portia laviata which demonstrates the evidence of a very aware complex planning, representation construction, and cognition. So let's take a closer look at what phenomenal consciousness really is like via five observations in our own human experience, independent of our brain states or processes. The first observation is that consciousness is a dynamic process wherein we seek out and or receive various qualitative sensations that we interpret as things in the world, including our own bodies. This categorization process draws from our memories of things we have sensed before and often repeated patterns. The results of interpretation form the basis of a new episode that can be added to our personal memory and narrative. Sometimes we do things without any recollection, out of habit, or by using learned skills that require little attention. And we do not remember the steps involved. The paradigm example is talking while driving. We can remember the conversations with little recall of the details sensed along the road. In summary, consciousness is a process of interpreting sensations using memory and adding to memory for at least some minimal duration. Because of associative inference, we can anticipate the future or even imagine counterfactuals. It is the consciousness process that enables prediction and control. Second, I've deliberately not mentioned self-awareness. Keeping track of the self comes naturally to humans since we are social beings with a language-based first-person point of view. We grow up in a unique body with private memories no one else has. Yet there are undoubtedly systems that lack a personal perspective while being fully aware of the world they have access to. Christoph mentioned this today. We're living, they are living or just existing without a metacognitive sense of personal identity. Humans sometimes seek and attain such a perspective under the influence of hallucinogens or meditation. Insisting that consciousness also be self-aware is blatantly anthropocentric. Third, we must give up on the illusion of conscious will. As explained by Dan Wagner in his book with that title, the decisions we freely make are simply those decisions that rise to the level of human conscious awareness, which we identify with as being our own as noted by the philosopher Fritjof Bergman. The rest of the decisions that come up are more like habits or compulsions. We are internally constrained and externally influenced in making decisions. If your decision coincides with your self-image after due deliberation, and there's no other explanation for it, it'll feel like your free choice. For cultures to function and hold people accountable, they cultivate carrots and sticks to help instill in the developing public participant the right behavioral habits and precepts like the universal golden rule. There's a fourth boogeyman to dismiss, which confuses people about the natural world that consciousness is part of. In science, we think in terms of laws of nature, too often as if they were prescriptions for nature to follow. This is a carryover from medieval times when people did not understand how things evolve without a deity. Nature is orderly, but there is no one giving orders. Every physical system in nature is finding its own way from moment to moment based upon its own internal constraints and the information that it is capable of distinguishing and responding to in the energy spectra that it can decode. For humans, a large cortex with associative memory, the hippocampus and the basal ganglia, they all constrain what we experience, remember, and they guide our decision-making. The most elementary systems studied in nature are the particles in the standard model. These have a tendency to exhibit certain properties when measured. They're also influenced locally and non-locally by present and past interactions. When the electron gets too close to a positron, they'll both be annihilated. No learning was required. So the fifth point is that there is something about being an electron or a positron that ensures this happens consistently. Dirac gave us math for describing what happens, but why it happens seems mysterious. They appear to have no internal structural constraints to explain their behavior. Rather, the scientist defines them by their observed behavior. They're behaving based entirely upon their intrinsic nature, which is like a memory with propensities that travel with them 
an inertia that resists change. It's an identity without a persona. It's anthropocentric to dismiss the behavior of an ego-free elementary system as being without sensations or to view it as anything less real than what is felt when the brain is acting in certain ways. They somehow sense the fields they travel in and the other particle fields they can interact with, even when there's no one home. There's something, there's nothing else to guide them. The laws of nature are nothing but what nature does captured in predictive human language generalizations. Just because we can predict and control an elementary physical process does not imply that there is nothing it is like to be such a process. All observable systems in nature that have some unchanging properties have thereby an identity by virtue of this memory-like inertia. Reduction of science shows us that we are each made up of a multitude of such fundamental systems. It's anthropocentric to claim that they are obeying laws when in fact they're instantiating them. It's more prudent by Occam's razor to assume that they are like us sensing and interpreting their own and neighboring quantum fields based upon their internal constraints. These systems are passive only relative to experimenters who can predict and control them. They are neither prey nor pawns of mathematical equations. Cultural bias in its baggage in the educational system often implicitly condones the five misconceptions just summarized. The result is that the idea that consciousness is a universal process from quarks to galaxies is a hard sell and presumed to be uh, on the woo-woo or spiritual side. There need be nothing like that in this UNCC panpsychism view, UNCC standing for universal correlates of consciousness, which by the way subsumes the NCC view or neural correlates of consciousness. Many will follow Seth's admonition to study brain correlates and just shut up and correlate, echoing the quantum physics mantra. Doing so is resulting in many profound and useful discoveries, but for many it comes at a cost of not feeling at home in the universe revealed by science. We can do better by challenging our anthropocentric assumptions. Uh, I believe there are tests for consciousness and simple organisms, even in non-living physical systems. These will involve looking for analogs therein by glossing over irrelevant detail and comparing to our own brain dynamics that neuroscientists continue to uncover. Analogical thinking is at the core of scientific observation and theorizing, and it needs to be recognized as a first principle, at least equal to the prediction and control mindset that it enables. We must temper our obsession with making distinctions by analysis to see how all systems are similar in fundamental ways by analogy. It's the similarities between human consciousness and all processes happening in nature that reveals our deeper psychic heritage. Analyzing and demonstrating universal conscious processes will set up a paradigm shift in understanding what it is like for me being me, you being you, and when it simply is what it is. Perhaps from time to time, we need to just shut up and compare. That's the end of my talk. Thanks for listening. Let's see, we are, we are a little short of time, but if, is there any, anybody have a question here? Oh, wait, please. So under your views, would you have prescriptions as to what we can do to understand consciousness better in your views? Like maybe not do science of explain, predict, control, but rather dot, dot, dot. Or is there, are you just drawing criticism with like, I know Seth's way of moving forward without necessarily. Yeah, yeah. good question. No, I think, uh, I think the prediction and control approach, what Neil and Seth uh, Neil Seth is, uh, is uh, uh, arguing for, needs to continue. It, it's a huge juggernaut. I work in this field with other, other neuroscientists and uh, they're, they're doing amazing things. But I think we need to do it with a more open mind to, to recognize that there are similarities between different kinds of systems, uh, not necessarily just having brains, uh, certainly all living systems, and, and the, if the point I was making is uh, the non-living as well. 
And if we can figure out what it is about the brain that does make us conscious, I think we're gonna be able to look for similar things in the rest of the universe. And it's gonna be an eye opener when it happens. Okay, so thank you once more. Very fascinating talk. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay.